southwest corner of South Vietnam, nestled among 4,000 foot high mountains, steep ravines, and thick jungle foliage, rests the small valley of Khe San. At this time in history, it is calm and peaceful. But from January 21st to March 31st, 1968, it was the scene of one of the most bitterly fought and highly publicized battles of the Vietnam War. For 70 days and nights, a determined group of 6,000 Marines and Allied troops held out against a besieging force of 20,000 North Vietnamese. Was Khe San worth it? Why did the U.S. military command feel it necessary to defend this outpost? This is its story. Many times I'm asked what part I think Quezon will play in the history of our country. And it's almost impossible for me to evaluate it since I was so close to the situation. However, I can tell you a little bit about it, and perhaps the place we should start is with an orientation of its location and some of the features around it. Quezon, as you know, is located 8 to 10 miles from the Sapon River, which is the boundary between Laos and South Vietnam. It's south of the demilitarized zone and has around it uh, certain hill masses which control some of the infiltration routes coming down in this general area. And of course uh, Route 9, basically the only road in this area, runs from the Laotian border, continues on through and goes almost to the coast uh, of uh, Vietnam. In about April of uh, 1967, uh, the battalion surprised an enemy element on this particular hill mass. And eventually it resulted in the Marines seizing Hill 861, 881 South, and 881 North. Uh, after these had been seized, it was determined that a small unit should be placed on Hill 950 in this general area here. So that uh, when August of 1967 rolled around uh, and I took over the base, I found myself with uh, troops on 881 South, 861, and 950. In the summer of 1967, the Battle of Khe Sanh was still many months away, but units of the U.S. Navy Seabees are already at work on the airstrip that will provide the only link with the outside while the Marines are busy digging trenches and building bunkers. The weeks that follow are relatively quiet. Marine units continue their patrol operations with very little enemy action. In December of 1967, intelligence sources indicate the start of an enemy buildup. Two North Vietnamese divisions are assembling in the deep areas around the base the communists could be preparing for a major assault. If the base is to be defended, it will have to be reinforced. The decision is made by General William C. Westmoreland, top commander of U.S. forces in Vietnam. The Marines will stay and fight. He is supported by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Quezon was an important outpost. If the enemy had taken this outpost, I think the province of Quang Tri and the DMZ area would have been in jeopardy. The enemy had planned to take it as part of his threat offensive. At the same time, he had planned to over on Quang Tri City, seize and uh, hold way, and to roll up our defenses south of the demilitarized zone. If he could have seized that uh, plateau, he could have run trucks with ammunition, logistics, and even conventional artillery into the Quezon Plateau, and uh, certain of our installations further to the east could have been made untenable. Now, we saw the enemy building up his forces in order to siege and eventually overrun Quezon as he did Den Ben Phu in 1954. The weather was very poor. In October, we had only one battalion there. In November, we increased it to uh, two battalions. 
December we kept two battalions there, but in uh, January we reinforced it with two more battalions, all Marines. And we then put a Ranger battalion in there. I wanted to put into case on enough troops that I thought could hold it against ground attack. But I didn't want to put more troops in there than, than we could supply by air. Kaysan and the NBN Fool. The comparison was natural. In August of 1954, French paratroops had moved into the Viet Minh stronghold, then a part of French Indochina, located in North Vietnam. Bringing in heavy artillery, tanks, and equipment, they prepared for the communists' attack led by the North Vietnamese general, Vo Nguyen Giang. But the French found themselves outmanned and outfought. They were surrounded, cut off from their source of supplies and reinforcements by a superior artillery, crippled by a lack of air power, and crushed relentlessly in Giap's powerful nutcracker. The end was inevitable. The French were overrun, forced to capitulate. The defeat brought an end to the Indochina War. Two months later, the armistice agreement was signed at Geneva. Vietnam was partitioned, Laos and Cambodia neutralized. French influence in Southeast Asia collapsed. The Russian communists were quick to congratulate the victors, Ho Chi Minh and his brilliant General Giap. Now, 15 years later, the same General Giap is determined to repeat his victory at Khe San. By January 1968, the stage was set. Inside the one mile by one half mile perimeter of the Marine garrison were 6,000 U.S. Marines, a battalion of South Vietnamese Rangers, and a handful of Air Force and CB support troops. Burrowed in bunkers and hidden under the triple canopied foliage that covered the surrounding slopes was the largest and best equipped force ever mustered by the enemy, 20,000 North Vietnamese Army troops. On the 19th of uh, January, there was a recon patrol which had gone out in this general area uh, north of Hill 881 North and uh, ran into considerable trouble and it, uh, it really developed into uh, quite a tense situation. But eventually we were able to uh, get them out and brought them back to Hill 881 South. So the next day uh, it was decided that we should go out and clean up this enemy force which had uh, evidently come in the 881 North area. So we sent one of the companies from 881 South towards 81 North and they uh, banged head on into what uh, evidently was a NVA battalion. This uh, uh, was a day long fight and by nightfall they were still in contact and uh, heavy action and uh, with nightfall coming on we withdrew them back to Hill 881 South. We had plans to go out the next day, but then on the morning of the 21st, about 0500 in the morning, the base received a heavy mortar, rocket, and artillery fire. Almost simultaneously, Hill 861 came under attack from about a battalion-sized NBA force, and that no sooner got started than down here in Quezon Village, a uh, CAC unit came under attack uh, by about a battalion, so we had three things going at once and naturally uh, my concern was with all of these forces which are around me as you can well imagine I began to become concerned that they might start closing the base however it didn't take very long to really upset me when in a few minutes later after this whole thing is boiling to a pot that the ammo dump went completely up and there were rounds flying all over the place The siege is on. The North Vietnamese launch a massive artillery attack. The Americans counter with record airstrikes and artillery, and the B-52s start their aerial bombardment. U.S. commanders predict a major North Vietnamese offensive just before the Lunar New Year on January 30th, or just after it. This could develop into the biggest confrontation of the war. The weather is on the side of the North Vietnamese. Communist gunners time their attacks to take advantage of the mist closing in on the airfield that hampers American planes from striking back. January 29th, a 
American intelligence reports presence of a fourth North Vietnam regular division in the Khe Sanh area, bringing the total estimated enemy strength in the area to approximately 40,000 regular troops. Half of these appear poised for the attack on the garrison. General Westmoreland positions his reserves of about 15,000 army troops plus a 5,000-man marine regiment at Phu Bai, about 60 miles southwest of Khe Sanh. In uh, early February, uh, the enemy again tried to take uh, the 861 complex. However, this time uh, they made an effort on a, its twin sister, 861A. The attack on uh, that hill uh, was repelled uh, through the use of uh, not only the supporting arms, artillery, air, but also, uh, as with every other attack on the corner, by the organic infantry weapons, the 81 millimeter mortars, 3.5 rockets, M79, machine guns and mines, and every other uh, weapon available to an infantry battalion. February 10th. The North Vietnamese Communist Party newspaper boasts that the U.S. faces a defeat as disastrous as that suffered by the French at the Nguyen Bien Phu. There is growing concern over the fate of the Marine garrison as the U.S. press also revives the specter of the Nguyen Bien Phu. At stake now is more than a key military stronghold. The Communists are out to inflict heavy casualties on the American troops with a major victory so that the U.S. would enter negotiations on terms favorable to Hanoi. The Battle of Khe Sanh. This was a very traumatic experience for the American people, but I never had any real concern about Khe Sanh. I had a few uh, restless nights, but I had full confidence that we were going to win the Battle of Khe Sanh because we had the means. The Americans have protection from big 175 millimeter guns at Camp Carroll, about 17 miles to the east and at the rock pile about 12 miles to the northeast. Inside the garrison, the troops have a handful of tanks, anti-tank weapons, 4.2 inch mortars, and about 20 artillery pieces, including 105 and 155 millimeter howitzers. But their secret weapon is their air power. Fighter bombers of the Navy. Marines and Air Force, capable of mounting 600 flights a day, plus the terrifying power of B-52 bombers that can drop 500 and 750 pound bombs on 50 bomber runs a day. And then there are the supply planes, giant C-130s and 123s that build a lifeline through the shrapnel infested skies to keep the Marines supplied with food, ammunition, medical supplies, building materials, and mail from home. And according to our calculations, we could supply caisson by parachute drop, and we had prepared ourselves for this uh, contingency uh, some uh, 18 months before. And during the ensuing period, I had required the commanders to rely from time to time on aerial resupply to practice the system and get the pilots accustomed to dropping these supplies in all weather conditions. So when the time arrived, we were able to supply that garrison of some uh, 5,000 people. We had built up an airfield that would take C-130s. And we put radar on the airfield, or GCA actually, so that we could uh, bring in uh, C-130s and 123s in all weather, and when it got too hot for them to land, having lost a couple of C-130s, then we started bringing them in for low-level extraction, where the supplies would be dropped or let to the ground from the uh, air platform by parachute. The result, of course, was that we supplied them. February 13th, Marine casualties mount when a U.S. Marine platoon is ambushed by the Viet Cong 800 yards outside the barbed wire. Throughout the month of February, the North Vietnamese artillery continues to pound the garrison. 
Some of their guns are apparently dug into the caves across the Laos border 10 miles away, believed to include 130mm and 152mm guns and rockets. The Americans counter with airstrikes and B-52 bombings, pinpointing the advancing communists only yards from the base perimeter. The Marines were told to button up. I told them to confine their patrols to close-end patrols for their own security because I did not want them venturing too far afield where men would get killed and wounded or, or lost uh, so that we could not afford to put our firepower in the area where we knew they were located. And we started pouring it on. And that's the thought that came to mind when I call this Operation Niagara. And this is exactly what happened. The bombs fell all the month of February and all the month of March. Arc light is the code name for these terrifying bombers. Coming in at 20,000 feet and literally destroying the target area with their 500 and 750 pound bombs. The North Vietnamese troops are forced to dig in, keep their heads down, and concentrate on avoiding being scorched by napalm or pulverized by the bombs. When bad weather comes, and at night, they bomb by radar, pinpointing their targets by means of a ground-controlled system called Sky Spot. February 22nd. Troop movements have indicated that the enemy is massing for the long-awaited attack. The defenders waited out in sandbag bunkers and trenches, their position surrounded by tangled coils of barbed wire studded with explosive charges and claymore mines. The incoming artillery fire, rockets and mortars of the enemy continue to pound the garrison. In Saigon and Honolulu, watch teams manning the war rooms wait throughout the weekend of March 3rd expecting word that the anticipated communists' assault has been launched. From the communists' viewpoint, the weather conditions are ideal, and American intelligence reports indicate that the all-out attack should come early Monday morning. But it does not develop. Apparently, the communists are unable to mass their troops for the attack because of the airstrikes and heavy bombardment. Also, the Marines still control the high ground guarding the approaches to Khe Sanh. Hills 881, 861, 950, and 558. So far, the enemy has been unable to take any of them. March 13th. This is the 14th anniversary of General Jap's attack on Dien Bien Phu, and time is running out for the communists. The Marines spend a relatively quiet day, waiting and watching. As I reflect back on it, I can uh, remember that the news stories coming out uh, were talking about the agony of Quezon and so forth and so on. I'm reminded of a story of the, and I know this to be true because I was standing there, Italian uh, newspaper man came in and uh, went around the base for a little while, met a lot of people and talked to people, and then he come back over and he said, uh, he says, you know, he says, uh, everybody you talk about... Uh, the agony at uh, Quezon. He says, uh, I uh, see no agony. He says, uh, you got the apple, you got the orange. He says, but on the other hand, I don't see any ecstasy. And uh, I think this is probably the way that all the men felt, that there was uh, certainly no uh, joy to it, but that the agony, the, there was none. Uh, the morale was good and outstanding. And everybody had a job to do and did it. Because of the resupply, we never ran out of sea rations. You could uh, take a walk through the trench lines and the bunkers and uh, find an array of uh, menus uh, being prepared. Some of them were quite elaborate. We'll just call them casseroles. Of course, these casseroles had various names. Several in particular that I remember were called Quezon Special. 
think that was uh, beef and uh, chicken cooked stewed together. Another one was called a Hippie's Delight. Now that was just about everything thrown in the pot together. And there was another one called uh, a Mulligan Stew. That was my specialty. I only had three meats in this uh, type of stew. Uh, we beefed it up with uh, hot sauce and uh, meat sauce, and it was quite tasty. March 26th, the enemy closes in, digging tunnels and working their trenches close to the base perimeter. Five times they have probed the garrison's defenses, hitting the perimeter in battalion strength. But each time they're thrown back. The enemy is still unable to mass for the all-out attack. March 27th, the enemy has withdrawn one of his two divisions, and substantial elements have been withdrawn from the second North Vietnamese unit. Now the heavy U.S. bombing and airstrikes only heighten the desire of the remaining North Vietnamese troops to get out as the monsoon lifts and the weather clears. The Marines move out of their trenches and bunkers to seek and engage the enemy on the ground. And on the 1st of April, the weather broke, and we were able to exercise our contingency plans by moving the 1st Cavalry Division, reinforced by a regiment of Marines, up Highway 9 to make a ground link up and the Marine engineers open Highway 9 and we've been rolling trucks over it ever since. These are the relief troops of Operation Pegasus, 30,000 men strong. A joint force composed of the 1st Air Cavalry Division of the U.S. Army and South Vietnamese troops. Sweeping down from the narrow highway from the north, they see little of the two North Vietnamese divisions that had surrounded the base. The enemy has left silently pulled out and given up the battle, leaving in his wake a scarred and churned up landscape, blown up and destroyed bridges that must be rebuilt before the convoy can proceed, and hidden mines that must be found and exploded. Fleets of helicopters lift men and artillery into the hills surrounding the base. And on April 7, lead elements of the relief troops walk into the base at Khe San. The long siege is over. It is my conservative estimate that 15,000 men were knocked out of action during that period of time. The result was that we broke his back, and he has not regained his strength since. We captured documents on the battlefield that attest to this. And we learned, we've learned from these documents that we not only killed a lot of the enemy and destroyed great quantities of his supplies, but we also made it so hot in that area that he was having great difficulty with desertions. Up to 20 to 25 percent of companies, according to these documents, deserted and just took off. And I think this is the first time in history where a siege of that magnitude has ever been broken by air power, but it was. And once it was broken by air power, and this was our strategy, it was exploited by a ground operation. But his back had been virtually broken when the ground troops arrived. The aerial bombardment on the North Vietnamese at Khe San was the most intense in the history of warfare. In all, from January 19th until March 31st, more than 103,000 tons of bombs were dropped on the besieging force. Navy, Air Force, and Marine pilots flew more than 24,000 sorties, including 2,500 by B-52s. In addition, the enemy was pounded by more than 100,000 rounds of artillery and mortar fire. After Marine units moved out of Khe San into the surrounding terrain, they discovered hundreds of North Vietnamese bodies in shallow graves. Total enemy casualties for the period were estimated at more than 15,000. Marine losses were 204 killed and 1,622 wounded and evacuated. On May 23rd at the Air Force Base in Utapau, Thailand, General Westmoreland paid tribute to the B-52 crews who had supported the aerial bombardment throughout the siege. You crews that man the B-52, but you've been part of the overall team, a professional team, but your contribution has been of the utmost importance, and we would not be in the posture today 
without what you have contributed. On that same day, at the White House in Washington, D.C., the 26th Marine Regiment and its reinforcing units were cited by the President for their gallant fighting and countless acts of individual heroism in defending Quezon. Colonel David E. Lowndes, the commanding officer of the Marine Post, received the Navy Cross. And Sergeant Major A.W. Smith, senior enlisted Marine at the base, was awarded the Bronze Star. Some have asked what the gallantry of these Marines and airmen accomplished. Why did we choose to pay the price to defend those dreary hills? The fortress at Quezon straddled critical supply and infiltration routes that the North Vietnamese were using. Route 9, which it commanded, was to be a major avenue for the enemy into populated areas and into the cities of South Vietnam. By pinning down and by decimating two North Vietnamese divisions, the few thousand Marines and their gallant South Vietnamese allies prevented those divisions from entering other major battles, such as those for Hue and Quang Tri. I believe that our initiative toward talks with North Vietnam was greatly strengthened by what these men did at Quezon, for they vividly demonstrated to the enemy the utter futility of his attempts to win a military victory in the South. Brave men such as the 26th Marine will carry on the fight for freedom in Vietnam, and soon, God willing, they will come home. We would like nothing more than to see that day. But until they do, we shall express at moments such as these, on behalf of all our American people, our great gratitude for the protection they have given us and our great appreciation for their selfless bravery. At Quezon today, the airstrip is deserted, and the trenches and bunkers have long since been abandoned. The defenders have gone, as the changing nature of a changing war imposes new requirements on military strategy. The battle that was fought here will now take its place in history. Perhaps someday, historians will call it the most important single battle of the Vietnam War. Only time can determine that.